Okay, this is the pre-class video for class number 16. We're doing, this is the first of two days on Buddhism. So um, here is your, here are the documents. Um, let's see. All right, so I start out with some quotes. And this would probably blow you away. It's just to help you realize how different similarities and differences. Okay, so Buddhism, do not believe in anything simply because you've heard it. All right. Um, and then you can compare this to religious traditions that you know of. I guess um, most of the students at Lyon, this isn't what, uh, this isn't kind of their attitude toward religion. Do not believe in traditions because they've handed down, been handed down for many generations. Do not believe in anything because it is spoken and rumored by many. Do not believe in anything simply because it's found written in your religious books. Do not believe in anything merely on the authority of your teachers and elders, but after observation and analysis, when you find that anything agrees with reason and is conducive to the good and benefit of one and all, then accept it and live up to it. So I've had students tell me that they were told that to believe faith is to accept without evidence. Well, this is exactly the opposite of Buddhism. For Buddhism, you never accept anything without evidence. Like the religion is entirely evidence-based. And somebody asked the Dalai Lama, okay, if it turns out that there's a new discovery in science and it contradicts Buddhism, what would you do? And he said, well, I would change Buddhism. <laughs> so um, not only that, but in your reading for today, the monk in the lab, it, it's obvious that the techniques of Buddhism, the rituals, the everything about it is evidence-based because they've done all sorts of research where they study the mind of a monk. They put the electrodes on and study the brain waves of the mind of a monk who's meditating and it's very very peaceful right they are very good um techniques for getting in touch with the atman brahman or for maintaining your mind in the midst of all sorts of uh you know maya all the stuff going on outside of you so that's the first thing is that buddhism is consistent with science, and they will change Buddhism rather than change science. Um, the second point I want to make is about what the book says about uh, Buddha's birth. And when I read it, I immediately thought of Jesus. So I will first read about Buddha's birth, and then I will remind you or if you don't know about Jesus' birth, there are so many similarities. It's just pretty amazing. So when Buddha, okay. Buddha's mother had a dream before giving birth to him. A magnificent white elephant with six tusks descended from the heavens, surrounded by a chorus of beatific praises. The elephant approached her, its skin white as mountain snow. It held, held a brilliant pink lotus flower in its trunk and placed the flower within the queen's body. Then the elephant too entered her effortlessly and all at once she was filled with deep ease and joy. The king summoned at the local, all the local holy men to divine the meanings of this dream. Their conclusion was, your majesty, the queen will give birth to a son who will be a great leader. He's destined to become either a mighty emperor who rules throughout the four directions or a great teacher who will show the way of truth 
to all beings in heaven and earth. All right, so what happened with Jesus? Um, the wise men had seen a star in the east. And also, do you remember the angel Gabriel came to Mary and told her she was going to have a very special son? And she said, well, how can this be since I don't have a husband? And the, it, Gabriel told her that God would impregnate her. So it was, there was a lot of special things going on. And um, then it was the custom. Then when they actually gave birth, the story of the actual birth, it was the custom in those days for a woman to return to her parents' home to give birth there. Buddha's mother set out for the capital of Kaliya, where her hometown, Along the way, she stopped to rest in a garden. The forest there was filled with flowers and singing birds. Um, admiring an ashok tree in full bloom, the queen walked toward it, when suddenly feeling unsteady, she grabbed a branch of the tree to support her. A moment later, still holding the branch, she gave birth to her son. Fortunately, the queen had attendants with her to wrap the child in silk and to escort mother and son back to the palace. Now, in Jesus' case, um, the political leader wanted everyone to register in their hometown, and Joseph's hometown was Bethlehem. So Mary and Joseph went to Bethlehem. And when they got there, there was no room in the inn because everybody else had come to register. So Mary was about to give a birth to a baby. So they put her in, the, in a manger in the, in the barn. And so Jesus was born in a barn and he was wrapped in swaddling clothes. So I do think that's pretty amazing. Um, all right, so then, so their birth stories are very similar. And then their stories about when they were in their late 20s, they had a conversion experience. And this is, psychologists say that this is a normal development. Um, your brain keeps growing until your late 20s, and then it sort of comes together. So a lot of uh, I don't know, psychologists recommend that after college, students have their odyssey years. Like they go out, they try a bunch of stuff, they travel, they just keep learning, they keep absorbing and because their brains are still growing. So you want your brain to be as stimulated as possible. And then in their late 20s, they can figure out what they really feel called to do, what they really think they enjoy doing, that the society needs, and that they will be most satisfied doing. Now, that happened to me. Um, so I went to grad school earlier than that, but I really wondered why I came there because I could nobody there was thinking the way I was thinking. And I got really confused. But then when I was 26, I, it all, I, ended up talking to a student and between those conversations I figured out what I really think and why I came there so that was in my late 20s 26 27 um, and all my kids went traveled a lot tried out a lot of things and always around age 26 27 all three of them told me okay mom I know what I'm gonna do and they turned down some other jobs, some other opportunities, because they really wanted to buckle in. And I think each of them has matched their natural abilities, their natural way of operating, to doing something that's also for the public good. And they're not having midlife crises. They're not wondering, why did I go in this? I'm just doing what other people wanted me to do. Um, so they, they're, they're in it. And I think it's partly because they were, they gave, they had that chance in their twenties to just have an odyssey years. Now we have um, city year, teach for America, 
um, Peace Corps is way out there, but there's a lot of opportunities. And for students who think they can't afford it, actually, um, you get paid, you get actually some money to pay back your loans, your college loans. You do get, you don't end up poorer after doing um, City Year or Teach for America. You might end up about even, but you, then you have all those experiences. You kind of know what you do and don't want to do. And you have a lot of contacts. So you develop a network of people who are like you, like-minded, and they go off in their own directions and things like that. So anyway, this is the story of Jesus and Buddha and what they did in their late 20s. So Buddha in his late 20s, all right. So his parents were told he was going to be either a great political leader and have a lot of power, or he was going to be a great spiritual leader. And, you know, guess what his parents wanted him to be? Um, all right. Okay. Um, so both of them had, this is what they had in common. They had moral seriousness. Um, they had a sense of cosmic purpose. They were identified as children, as someone who would grow up as a leader. Um, okay, and okay, Buddha's parents were determined to distract him. They wanted him to get attached to material things, to money and power, because then he would become this great ruler. And um, what happened was he was very protected in the palace because he was born uh, the father of a king, a local king. And um, then he got, he went outside and took a walk. Um, but again, he was, there was a whole entourage of people sort of protecting him, but he had the four noble sites. So his parents were trying to get him, you know, completely oblivious to anything bad in life, but he had the four passing sights. The first one was illness. He saw somebody who was sick. He hadn't seen that before. A um, death, all right. He hadn't been exposed to that. Aging, and then he saw a monk who had a begging bowl who had withdrawn from life and he was in touch with the jiva. And when Buddha saw that, he said, he, he said that's, that's what I want. I want to be a monk. And um, he was married and he had a son, but he, um, he left in the night and he went on his spiritual quest. And his, he was trying to seek enlightenment, right? He's in search of enlightenment because he was Hindu, he was raised Hindu, and um, he knew that the goal was enlightenment. His parents wanted him to be on the path, obviously a pleasure, um, success, maybe duty, <laughs> but not the fourth path, enlightenment. But that's what he chose. He, and um, it took him six years and it went in three phases. His first way of enlightenment was to study the Hindu Vedas, the holy books. And, um, and then he realized, you know, enlightenment is not in a book. It's not in a doctrine. It's, it's beyond that. But he tried and he talked to all the, the priests, right? And the Hindu Brahmin. But then he moved on and he tried asceticism. He tried denying himself physical pleasures. Um, he tried extreme self-denial. And finally, he gave that up because it was too much and it was distracting. It wasn't leading to enlightenment. So he chose the middle way. <laughs> well, the middle way 
the mean between extremes, well, that would be Aristotle, and that would be Confucius, and that would be um, uh, Hinduism, right? And so he's a Hindu, and he chose the middle way. And then he decided that he was going to, his focus was going to be on rigorous thought, right? And mystic concentration. So he found a tree, the bow tree, and he sat down and he was determined he wouldn't get up until he had experienced enlightenment. Well, Maya, the evil one, came and tried desperately to tempt him. So he had four temptations. The first one was the god of desire. And so he has all these voluptuous, wonderful women that Buddha has to, you know, he puts in front of Buddha's mind and um, he has to concentrate himself out of that. The second one is death. Okay, so he has all these things to be spooked about, you know, uh, fear. So there's pleasure, he has to get over that. Fear, he has to get over that. Then um, uh, the God of desire, the Lord of fear, and then he says, um, Maya says, what right do you have to do this? And, um, and then finally, Maya says, um, now that you've, oh, okay. So he challenges right to do it. And he said, this is my, he could, you know, talk him out of that. This is my way. And then he sat for 49 days, right? Um, and he had this great awakening. And that's like Arjuna in chapter nine of the Gita. He has this, he sees the Brahman, all of reality. And then one last time, Maya comes back and says, why not end your life now in your state? You're in a state of bliss. Like, why go back to the world? It's so mucky and evil and just, you know, confusing. And he said, there will be some who will understand. And then he touches the earth. And so when we look at the art, you're going to see Buddha in the earth touching pose. So then he started his preaching, his life redeeming message. He founded an order of monks. And his main thing was to challenge the corruptions of Brahmin society. So if you remember, there's four castes. The Brahmins are the spiritual leaders. And he challenged them. He exposed their corruption. Now, what did Jesus do at age 30? This was Buddha at age 29 to 30. It was called the great going forth. Okay, what happened to Jesus? Um, Jesus got baptized by his cousin, uh, John. And he heard a voice. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. And then he spent 40 days in the wilderness meditating, basically. He wasn't just sitting under a tree. He was sort of walking around, I guess. Um, and then he was, after 40 days, he was hungry, right? And so the devil tempted him. And the first temptation was turn these stones into bread. If you really are special, turn these stones into bread. And Jesus said, man does not live by bread alone. And so what he's saying basically is that you shouldn't sell your soul for money or food or anything like that. Like we are more than just physically craving. We're more than animals. There's more to life than just food. The second temptation. Uh, the devil takes him up to the top of a tower and he says, throw yourself down and God will, if you're so special, God will save you. And Jesus said, thou shall not tempt the Lord 
your God. And so you can think about some preachers. I remember one years ago named Oral Roberts, and he was trying to get funding for a cancer uh, hospital. And he said, you know, if I don't get a million dollars or something by some date, I'm going to jump off a cliff or something. I mean, he was doing exactly what the story says not to do, tempt God. And that was just, and the money poured in. I mean, he did collect all the money. Um, and then the third temptation, uh, the devil says, if you will worship me, I will give you power over all the nations. And Jesus said, um, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, him only shall thou serve. So that was the temptation to get power. So in both cases, each of them had a chance to get power, but they chose to be spiritual leaders. Now, this, I think, points to the fact that there are a lot of cult leaders who actually um, have, you know, kind of spiritual, they tap into people's spirits. And I think if you are a really serious, really, really serious person, there's a sense that you could think, I could really get power over people if I wanted to, <laughs> because I can, you know, I've been there. I've been in this psychological place that people could worship me and then I could get them to do anything. And so they have that temptation and um, <clears throat> they reject it. But there's other, there's other, kinds of leaders like this, Jim Jones, David Koresh, who have that same kind of charisma and they give in to the temptation. And I don't know if you've heard of these people, but that's probably you know a pattern that will come up again and again every once in a while. There's in the news, some cult leader um, does something and the followers just kill themselves or follow blindly. Um, but in this case, both Buddha and Jesus preached a redemptive message, and they both called out the corruptions of the institutionalized religious leaders, and they both tried to get people to get back to the life of the spirit. Um, all right. So, okay, so let me go to this. This is the, uh, the chart where Houston Smith talks about these six qualities of every aspects of every religion, and then um, how Buddha responds to the Brahmins, and also Jesus responded to the Pharisees and the Sadducees in the Sermon on the Mount. This is very similar, I think. Okay, so in the Brahmins case, um, there was a caste system. The Brahmins were the official spiritual caste. And um, Buddha's response was that there is no spiritual authority. There's no caste of people. There's no, there's no person has spiritual authority over you. Everyone seeks his or her own salvation, which is liberation, diligently. And they can achieve nirvana just by their own force of will right now, which is <laughs> incredible. Like it takes all the power away from the Brahmins. Well, if you remember what Jesus said, he said, the essence of the law and the prophets is love God and love your neighbor. And the key is purity of heart. And don't be hypocrites like the Sadducees and the Pharisees. So he's telling them, you don't have to pay any attention to the religious leaders. They're hypocrites. And also the law, like the Torah, you don't have to follow the letter of the law. It's the spirit of the law. So Jesus also takes all the authority away from the religious leaders. Of course, they're not happy about that. Um, then there are rituals. So the Brahmins controlled the rituals. 
um, every religion will have all these watershed moments, right? Birth, uh, confirmation, adulthood. Um, uh, if you become a monk, you know, your rite of passage or marriage and then death. So these are all big watershed moments. And the religious leaders were in charge of them. So the idea was like, you're not gonna make it to heaven unless you get baptized or you're not gonna, your spiritual life is not gonna work unless you go through these various rituals. And Buddha said, no. <laughs> and Jesus did too. He, he loved the outcast, the woman with five husbands. I mean, these weren't people that followed all the rituals that he embraced. Um, so Buddha says there's no rituals necessary. It's just meditation practices. You just have to be diligent about your meditation. And that's how you get liberated. Then there's the speculation, the nature of the universe, life's meaning. Um, if you remember the path to God through reason was you think of God as energy and you study the Vedas and you try to get in touch with that energy via the doctrine. And the Brahmins, this was also written in Sanskrit. So the average person just couldn't read it. And they had to completely trust the Brahmins that they knew what they were talking about. Um, same thing happened in the Catholic Church is that the mass was in Latin and um, they were the only ones who knew Latin. So that, that put them, gave them all this authority and ability to, to give all these arguments and to do all this sort of intellectual, um, intellectualizing about religion. And um, Buddha said, no, <laughs> there's no speculation. Nirvana is not based on your beliefs. It's based on your inner experience. Um, same with Jesus. I will write the law on their heart. Um, it's your inner experience that matters. Uh, the tradition. What about the wisdom that's passed down for, um, and inherited? And then people have power, right? They, when they pass down the, the wisdom, they also pass down the power. So that's an, another part of speculation. So it was reading from the Veda, and it was also speculating about the nature of the universe. And Buddha said, nope, you don't have to. Um, there's no tradition. There's just liberation. And then every religion has some foundation of hope. At the end of the day, the universe is friendly. And the, the goal is to be seek eternal life, spiritual life, and be liberated from this life um, or from the pleasures related to this life. You can live your life without being bogged down by sin or by um, maya. So the Brahmins, and this is, you could figure this out, right? The way they said to women, just accept your fate put up with abuse, even if your husband's a lousy guy, because you're a woman, because either you made a mistake in the past or you need more incarnations. And that was fatalism, right? There's nothing you can do. Uh, you couldn't control the fact that you're a woman. And the fact that you're a woman meant there was something bad in your past life. And that's fatalism. And then they just told that. They use that to maintain their power and privilege. Okay, so Buddha says, nope, there's no outside grace. Everybody is born and capable of achieving liberation in this life, okay? I mean, the other thing uh, is he claimed, I mean, it's, again, it's ambiguous. So we'll go over that about whether women can achieve liberation or not. Um, that's another example where I think the institutionalized leaders long after Buddha died decided that they were going to make the religion sexist, but uh, Buddha was not sexist. Um, and the last one is mystery. And this would be where when people get desperate 
and the religious leaders just start saying, oh, God is in charge, you know, just, um, and people start wanting to escape and believe in miracles and um, just not have to deal with life at all. And the Brahmins will sort of reinforce that uh, as long as their, their authority is not um, questioned. And Buddha says, nope, <laughs> there's no mystery. There's no outside forces to be paranoid about. It's all from within. All right. So those are the analogies between Jesus and Buddha. Then he did, Buddha did try to write down his doctrine. And it's not a doctrine where you believe it or you don't believe it. It's all very intuitive, right? So um, the Four Noble Truths are life is suffering. Um, so don't complain. You know, people complain about this and that. This is like life is suffering. Just accept it. The cause of suffering is your own desire. It's because you want pleasure that you suffer and get frustrated. It's because you want success that you run into all these obstacles. It's because you want to do your duty and um, give money away and, and have people actually change, which you can't accept, you can't control. And the cure for all of these false desires is release, liberation, nirvana. Okay, and the way to release. So there's an eightfold path. And this one you could compare again with Aristotle. You have to associate with the right people. Well, that's friendship. You have to have the right intent. What do you really want? And um, that goes back to Hinduism. And that goes back to um, the four paths in Hinduism. And in Aristotle, he, the key with Paris's choice is that young people have three choices. They can choose pleasure, which will eventually mean wealth because you have to have money if you're gonna seek pleasure, or honor and power. You want glory and you want power. You don't want power unless somebody glorifies you <laughs> for having it. Um, and Or wisdom and justice and truth. So what is your intent? What do you really want? Um, and then the importance of telling the truth, of right speech. So this was when Socrates, if you remember, one of the biggest corruptions of Athens was the corruption of speech. And so in the Apology, he said, you know, my detractors have said all these awful things about me. But the most important thing is that they said, don't listen to Socrates. He has this tricky kind of rhetoric. And Socrates said, no, I don't. Like, I really don't. It's the sophists that do. They taught this art of persuasion that completely corrupted Athens because you could get the masses, the assembly, and the jurors to actually get sucked into that rhetoric and accept it. So right speech is really important. Um, and Jesus also was against the false speech, right? The lies of the religious leaders. Right conduct is really important, obviously. You have to reflect on your actions and your motives. And you know, there's some basic no-nos, like the Ten Commandments. No killing, no stealing, no lying, no unchaste acts, and no drinking. So these are the basics. Um, then you have to get a job that isn't a corrupting influence, right? Um, there's some jobs that you just shouldn't have. <laughs> uh, drug dealer or something, you know, weapons manufacturer or something like that. But... Um, you don't have to, you don't get your meaning in your job. It's what you do and you do it with this detachment. Um, and then right effort. You have to be compassionate toward other people. You don't create any bad karma. 
and then you stay detached. You don't get um, emotionally uh, connected to all the things around you. Um, and this is an important quote. <laughs> I'm warning you, I'm an old lady. Uh, please take heed. All we are is the result of what we have thought. All things can be mastered by mindfulness. Yeah, and I, there are times in my life when I got too angry and it wasn't, you know, I have these memories of getting angry and it wasn't for a very long time, 10 minutes or something, but it was so deep that I still have to live with that memory. And so I'm trying to warn you to try and engage in mindfulness and avoid creating these neural <laughs> connections and these memories of having blown, you know, blown your top, you know, gotten too mad. So this really is a good exercise and all the uh, scientists, biologists, everybody who studies the mind says, yeah, this is the way to keep your brain healthy and keep your life healthy and keep this integration between body, mind, and spirit. Um, okay. So Buddha resisted concepts. He taught for 25 years. Um, he didn't have a set doctrine because there's nothing you're going to memorize. And, you know, I am my Facebook page or I am my belief system. No, you aren't your belief system. You are your way of life. Um, so, um, the, there's an idea that the idea is that you don't have a soul. There's nothing. You're just part of the universe and you don't give any resistance. Um, and the wind, right, blows, blows through you. Um, so, yeah, the image of the flame is the flame is sort of constantly burning and constantly changing and using substance. So it's trying to be, give you a sense of the transience of life so that you don't sort of have an ego and set it down here. And here's, you know, put yourself in this box and this is who I am. Um, okay. And again, polarization. I think if you were a good Buddha, Buddhist, you wouldn't polarize. You wouldn't talk to people in any kind of polarizing way. And you wouldn't think of people in any kind of polarizing way. You would just always want to communicate with them and um, do whatever you needed to have compassion. Do whatever you need to do to um, create positive relationship. All right, so the characteristics of Buddhism, they're empirical. Buddha tested all this stuff. You know, what sort of position to sit in? And the Hindus already had it down to an art form. So um, the yoga, yogi. So he had a lot to work from, but he kept on working on it and refining it, his technique. And he had a different view of reality underneath it. So um, it was lived experience, it was pragmatic, you solve problems, how to get people to live flourishing lives. Um, it was therapeutic, it's trying to help people with suffering. Um, I'd say all the religious traditions are trying to deal with unjust suffering. People just have to find some way of coping with it because it doesn't make any sense. But the human condition is so frail and vulnerable that it definitely happens. And we went over that um, outline before. It's psychological, coping mechanisms. It's egalitarian. Anybody can seek nirvana. And it's individual. So you have control over it. Nobody can tell you uh, how to, you know, what to do or how to live. You decide for yourself. Then there's two schools of thought, the monks, and then the ones who return to the world. 
So the ones who are the monks say that, well, Buddha's main thing was about meditation. And the ones who return to the world say, yeah, but when Maya said, well, why don't you just die tomorrow? He said, there will be some who understand and he touched the earth. And so their, their interpretation is that Buddha went back and he went into the world. So that's why they prefer it. But in a lot of ways, it's just that these people are on the path of reflection and the path of the yogi. And these people are on the path of the heart and the path of the action. Um, it's, so Hinduism was aware of this. And when Buddhism emerged from Hinduism, it has a lot of those same. They aren't really doctrines, they're just perceptions about human life. There are introverts and there are extroverts. Um, Zen Buddhism was influenced by Taoism, and I will talk about that later. Um, this is the list of Jesus and Buddha and the differences, what they had in common, the great going forth, and Jesus' um, temptations in the wilderness. And that is in the Sermon on the Mount, right toward the beginning. I can show you that um, and how you compare it to a cult leader um, and what, what qualities of leadership, right? So this is a different perception of leadership. It's about spiritual leadership. Um, let's see. So. Here's Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, and he's tested in the wilderness, right? So Jesus led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted, right? And so you can compare that, and then he begins to preach, just like Buddha did. They had that experience, and after that, they started their uh, mission, their preaching. Um, this one is uh, the monk in the lab. And this thing is uh, 27 pages, but you, can, you only have to read the first three pages. The rest of them are just, um, a lot of it when I tried to scan it, it didn't scan very well, but that's plenty, plenty of reading. Um, and then this one is Aristotle's Virtues again. So let's go over these quickly and then I'll, uh, I think I'm, I have 10 minutes left. Okay, self-control, obviously, Buddha tried asceticism, right, to really deny himself food. Um, and he gave up on that, right? So he's finding the middle way, which is very Aristotle would approve, um, and courage. He, he was, um, he faced courage, okay, in relation to um, his fear of getting in trouble with the Brahmins, like he had the courage to speak out against the religious leaders and to expose their corruption. He also had the courage to leave home and give up the chance to be a king or a great ruler. He had the courage to, you know, he didn't know if he was going to succeed. He lost all of his status. He was ostracized. I mean, he, this too, it was a big risk, but that's it. It was his choice. Um, he gave away his time, right? He was generous with his time. Um, he was even tempered, right? That was part of the whole Hindu Buddhist thing is to stay detached. Don't let yourself have a temper. Uh, rational ambition. He was definitely ambitious in the sense that he decided he could work out his, uh, meditation technique and he could achieve nirvana. And then he started preaching about it. So he, you know, he knows his value and he is ambitious. Um, pride, he knows that what he does should be honored, um, but he doesn't really want to be worshiped by people at all. He wants them to learn the techniques. Um, Jesus was the same. I think he just wanted people to understand his way of life. Um, and people too often. Confucius wanted that also. But people get confused and they start worshiping the person rather than understanding the way of life that they're trying to point to through the way they live. Um, Buddha was, I can't remember if we read anything about humor. He had friendships, 
right? The other monks. He was closely bonded with people. He was sociable, obviously. And he was truthful. So his whole thing is this is the truth about life. And so he's preaching truth. And a lot like Hinduism, if you remember Gandhi, truth force, he's going to act on the basis of truth force. Um, and Buddha also felt like when you're liberated, whatever you choose to do is motivated by the truth, the force of the jiva within you. Um, he condemned um, greed, of course, and um, he didn't, um, I think for legislation, distri distribution of wealth, this, this is interesting because one of the criticisms of Buddhism is that it doesn't focus on political issues. It's, it's uh, too exclusively religious and spiritual. So sometimes Buddhist monks ignore social problems, but not always. And that isn't necessarily fair. But in the readings that we read, um, there will be some criticisms of Buddhism as too self-absorbed. And then there will be examples. Um, I'm not sure. I guess I don't have you reading an example. But there are Buddhist monk, monks who are activists. I remember in the Vietnam War, there were some Buddhist monks in Vietnam. One in particular doused himself with gasoline and lit himself on fire as a protest against the war. Um, okay, let's see. Um, all right, so Buddha's meditation is not an intellectual exercise, but on the other hand, Buddha basically created, what he created is a meditation technique and a tradition. Um, and that's a creative activity. And then, so he used his mind to calculate things, but always related to that intuition. Does this pose work? Does this way of breathing work? And it is verifiable through scientific uh, method, but um, it's scientific method dedicated to forming a great mystical uh, technique. Um, all right, so that again, once again, it's another version of the union of science, social science, and um, religion, or philosophy, you can call Buddhism a philosophy, not a religion. Um, people who grow up in a Buddhist country, and same with Hindu, they never thought of it as religions. They thought of them, these traditions as a way of life. And it was the West, it was colonialism. When Westerners came over, they categorized Hinduism and Buddhism as religions. And that was partly to put them down and partly to say they're more primitive than we are. We have our religion, Christianity, but it's a better religion and it's consistent with progress and science and whatever, I don't know. But they did try to, that was a way to put them in a box and argue for their own cultural superiority, which I think, you know, we that legacy is not the best uh, tradition. That's not a positive thing that we, are remembered by. And nowadays, post-colonialism, there's a lot of that is exposed and rejected, and I'm glad it is. We claim to be uh, believe in freedom and equality. Remember, Gandhi would thought that that's what the West stood for, and then the way they devolved into fascism, and Stalin, Hitler, all those authoritarian leaders, and then the way the British treated the people in India. So they were just exposed, right? You don't really believe in these things. You don't live that way. So gradually the yoke of colonialism is um, taken off the necks of um, people in developing countries. And they are sort of figuring out 
what they want to keep of their tradition and how they want to develop it and how they want to develop their own culture in a way that is going to be sustainable, egalitarian, whatever. And um, there's a difference between the way these traditions were lived out centuries and centuries ago and the way that current Buddhists or Hindus, it's usually called Neo-Buddhism or Neo-Confucianism when you very self-consciously are adapting it to what we know now, or the circumstances under which people live now, and things like that. So, all right, so I will see you tomorrow. And I think that was about the right amount of time. Um, all right. <laughs>